Yeah, so I guess one thing to note about that is the, um, I kind of went in the opposite direction and away from the sort of emotion of, of the vocal and of the chords in the original track and towards this kind of really like jazzy groove, this kind of section. <laughs> This, this sort of thing. Um, but then actually present in like both of the bro both of the breakdowns, like both of the pre-drops, we have this much kind of floatier thing with the synth and the vocals, this, this kind of material. Um, sorry, I'm being told off for riding my uh, volume control here. Will do. Um, yeah, so there are kind of these two like opposing vibes, I suppose. And I think that that's something I find I end up doing quite a lot when I'm making music and I think can be a really useful way to think of the key elements in your track. Like if you have, um, you know, well, first of all, it's good to see if you can figure out what the key elements of your track are. Like, what what is the hook here? And it might be like, okay, it's it's the basic groove around this drop, or it might be like, it's this vocal and this chord sequence or, or whatever. And if you can find um, a couple of those things that are kind of in tension with each other or in conversation with each other, um, then I think you can, I, I find myself, very often basically using that to derive the structure of the track. Because um, say, in a, you know, in your average club track, you've got an intro, maybe a little bit of a breakdown, drop one, it builds, breakdown two, drop two, out. That's probably the most simple structure for a club track. And so, you know, within that, you have the opportunity for kind of, it, maybe a good way to imagine it is like, imagine you have like a wet, dry, slider or, or knob and and your wet is your like kind of floaty echoey ethereal or, or whatever the idea may be and then dry is like these really satisfying drums uh, and it's kind of playing with the balance between these two things and then maybe in your track you sort of go slowly from one dale to the other and then back and then you do that a couple of times um so i find that to be like quite an interesting way of thinking about structure um so yeah, this, this track kind of starts with an intro. And when I was writing the intro, I kind of wanted to write some new melodic material. And one of the things I did was I made this kind of like choir of singing bowl samples. I love uh, using bells and stuff in, in my music. And, and so yeah, we can see maybe here we've got um, essentially just a bunch of samples that I've kind of tuned um, using just the pitch control in in, um, in the sample window in Ableton to make this kind of sound here. Um, which kind of cuts in and out. Um, and one thing I ended up doing that I, I was quite pleased with is like if we just take a couple of these bowls that's the same pitch. Hold on. Here. And we look in the sort of uh, this window, whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't know what all the windows are called in Ableton. This one here. Like um, basically I kind of undoubling two, but one of them is just slightly detuned here in the fine tuning. Um, if we kind of hear them without that, then it's very kind of pure. But the further away we get, the more we get that sort of slightly chorus effect. So yeah, all of the pitches in this chord are sort of doubled and, and have this kind of slight detuning like that. And then I'm cutting in and out with these other elements as well in this intro. Um, like this. have these other details and it will stop and then like that um i quite enjoy that kind of chopping and changing in my music and it's nice i think when you do it between sort of stuff that has like different um qualities in terms of the frequency spectrum so for example here 
this uh, sort of stabby sound. It's very pr like prominent in the mid, uh, and then there's kind of not much else going on. Whereas this one, this tom, you've got like a low drum, but then a high sort of brush sound, and, and that kind of very quick contrast, and then kind of cutting back is kind of like, it's quite nice sort of detail and surprising for the ear. Um, yeah, and then otherwise through the intro, it's just kind of slowly um, bleeding in rhythm, uh, which I usually do, yeah, once we sort of start getting hi-hats and stuff from here. Um, And I feel like an awful lot of my kind of intros, out, uh, outros, breakdowns, I'm like so many tracks, particularly percussion, is sort of riding around on those, those high cut filters to kind of create these textures that slowly build or shift and then, um, but kind of critically holding back those very, very top frequencies of the percussion or the very low frequencies of the percussion for the drop because you want to have something that feels new and satisfying for, for those moments when they come in. Um, but then when you're doing that, I think you still want to think about the whole f spectrum. So like, uh, you know, maybe your hi-hats and your drums and stuff are all kind of really filtered, but then maybe you've got, I don't know, like some, some hiss or some vinyl crackle at the top or like something that has a bit of, of low end to it to kind of still make it feel full. Um, yeah, I think I think a kind of easy mistake to make is to be like, right, I'm going to filter everything so I can kind of bleed it in slowly through this intro, but um, uh, but then it just sounds, you know, like you're playing it out of phone <laughs> or something if you're not careful. Um, so yeah, then we get into the groove. Um, yeah, I probably won't go into like too much detail about kind of the production details of this. Um, but maybe one thing I might talk about briefly, because it was a bit of a revelation to me when I was um, putting this track together, was the way I processed some of the breaks. Um, so here we've got just like a little, uh, yeah, kind of little drum break, which I've <laughs> cut up like this. And this really like sits in between other stuff. So this, this the purposes of, of this pattern, maybe this pattern and this snare together is, is to be those kind of ghost notes that I was talking about on the drums. So, you know, I've got like my main kick and my main snare and my hi-hats doing really obvious stuff, but then I'm filling out that rhythmic space and there's a swing to it as well. Um, and in order to kind of get it staccato enough that it's not overwhelming, um, I'm kind of going into the sample and in the way that I'm warping it, I'm using, you probably can't quite see, but that one that plays only a single sample at a time. And you can kind of use that almost as a gate to get these kind of really staccato type feelings. But the problem you get with that is uh, you will get some really sharp transients. So you'll get, you know, it's like a really kind of type of percussive thing and you have these really kind of sharp attacks that don't linger very long. And that's gonna bring up the sort of, true peak level of your, your pre-master and make it hard to make your track loud without squashing it all down. Um, and one of the things I kind of really got into when I was doing this mix down is, you know, because I've always sort of struggled with like, how do you compress stuff so that your track is loud in general? Um, and I was chatting to a friend of mine and kind of had a bit of a breakthrough when I sort of got really into like saturation and uh, also parallel saturation and compression, which I'll maybe go into a bit more later. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a bit mad when you look at what this actually does. So here I've just got a like a loudness analyzer. This is just a um, free uh, Melder Audio loudness analyzer. And if I just kind of play the sample as it is, you can see here on the this measure here is called Luffs, and this kind of measures how loud we it sounds to our ears basically like kind of averages out the loudness to kind of give an impression of what it sounds like and then 
this one at the top here is how loud it actually is in those peaks moment to moment. So we can see our perceived loudness was setting like around zero and we're also up to zero on these peaks, true peaks. Uh, and then one of the things I did was I put a, a saturator on. This is just a capitator. I've not got it a full wet, which means it's processing in parallel. Uh, I've pulled the drive back. You probably wouldn't hear really any difference to the sample, really. Some you know slight detail difference. But if we go to our loudness analyzer and look at that, hold on, reset. We've kind of gained five, six dB of headroom here on this sample. But it still sounds as loud to our ears. You can see the luffs are sitting around the same thing. So it's like an almost inaudible effect that really kind of cuts off those sharp transients that you don't need because they just don't improve your mix. Um, and so I started doing that in very small ways, like very carefully so you can't, it doesn't sound distorted, you can't hear the saturation too much across various uh, instruments and bits of percussion and stuff in the mix. Um, and then you can do it in stages as well, so you can do it in groups. So for example, that snare break has got some saturation there. At the top of the group, I've got another saturation saturator here doing something quite gentle in parallel. Um, and kind of repeated saturation in stages like this, apparently this works because it's a lot like old style analog mixing desks, where maybe your channel, something about the circuit, the valve in the circuit slightly saturates the sound and then it goes to another bus and then that slightly saturates the sound and then there's something about kind of layering saturation in this way that sounds very nice, it's not too intrusive, um, but yeah. And when I got this master back, I think this is maybe my favorite master that I've ever got back and it just sounded louder and chunkier than anything I'd really got by before. So that was a real like light bulb moment for me in terms of, um, yeah, figuring out how to make stuff louder. We've got a question, yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm not limit, uh, so the question, sorry, yeah. The question was, am I doing any limiting with the saturator? Um, it's possible I have some parallel compression turned on. So there's maybe a little bit of compression as well. I'm not limiting anything here. I mean, I might occasionally use a limiter on a track, like I think I sometimes will put a limiter on a kick if it's very, very sharp. But um, I, yeah, try and avoid limiters in favor of, I guess rather than trying to squash things from the top, it's about how can you bring things up from the bottom, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, then I guess kind of moving on in the track a little bit, it's then developing and bleeding in really small amounts of percussion um, to kind of develop over whatever it is, 32, 64 bars or whatever it is until we get to the breakdown again. Um, this kind of development is like one of the most difficult things about making tracks for me is like, okay, so we get to our first drop. I don't want to strip so much out that it feels empty and that, you know, the like we have the breakdown, the beat comes in and it's a bit of a like kind of moment. Um, but so you, so you need to keep a bunch of stuff in so it, it feels like a satisfying moment and a good groove. But then if you put all of your percussion in, you kind of have nowhere to go. Like how, because then you loop it for 16 bars and then as you get into 32 bars, it's kind of boring. Or at least this is what I feel about my own music when I make it. Um, so it's about how to kind of hold stuff back and like subtly build across, I don't know, 32 bars or whatever. And uh, I think the key is it's often like, a good question to ask yourself is like, how little can I change, you know, uh, to, to kind of make this build? So like from here, where we've got our kind of opening groove, hold on, let's unsolo this stuff. There we go. We then go into like the next eight and all that really happens is I've got some extra hi-hats which are doing the same rhythm but just sit in a slightly different frequency range. And then these brushes that we found earlier. And like, you might not even notice this over, you know, if, if you're playing it on some speakers over the other side of the room. 
whilst you're like making dinner or whatever, but like on headphones or on a big rig, I think you'll feel a slight. I'm not sure whether that will come through in this context, but you'll feel a slight lift to the energy there. And then that's bought me like a good, uh, whatever this is, 16 bars. And then I bring in the loading material. That's great. That's it. Those vocals are coming in, start extending the vocals. And from here, it's really a process then of trying to kind of slowly bleed in more high frequencies in like subtle ways or, or high frequency energy. So like at some point, my favorite is always um, quarter note ride. That always kind of subtly gives the groove like a lot of forward momentum then just opening up a lot of the cutoffs and the synths and stuff and just making them kind of slowly brighter. And then as we get towards the breakdown, like automating out some of that satisfying percussion, you know, maybe bringing the bass up from the bottom, bringing the hi-hats and stuff down from the top so that it kind of... This may or may not come across, uh, but the, I had a lot of fun with these two vocals here that I'm kind of like putting in conversation with each other. And slowly panning them hard left and hard right as the, the panning kind of does this. So that's quite like a fun stereo effect that will be lost on most club systems. But anyway, I liked it. Um, and then also one of the nice things about these vocal stems is I got the vocal processing as a separate stem. So like we have one track that's just the dry vocal and then one track that's like, um, yeah, all of the reverbs and, and the delays. And so I ended up making this very, very dry because I want to, particularly when we get to the second drop, I always want to try and create a little bit of negative space and expectation before that kind of comes in like that. So yeah, pulling it back so the vocal's really dry. I think we've got a really dry like sine wave organ type sound. <laughs> or we would if I hadn't soloed that track. Um, so, yeah, then I guess there's this question of like, in, in terms of like a structural thing, there's this question of like drop one versus drop two. Um, uh, there was a good, Minor Science did a good all center discord where he did a kind of production tutorial and there was some chat in that about like the philosophy of first versus second drop. And I think for lots of tracks, uh, he kind of pointed out, like for lots of tracks, having them be exactly the same is totally fine. Um, but it can be nice to have a sense of development from one to the, the other, like trying to make that second drop just a little bit more exciting. Um, so then it's a question of like, how do we do that? How much do you need to change? And I feel like when I started out producing, this was kind of one of my biggest headaches, was like constantly bringing in like whole new bass sounds or whole new bass lines or just like massive new elements to the track to try and make that that sort of second drop really exciting. But then the structure of your track doesn't really work. It doesn't hang together because you've sort of got two different vibes going on from the start to the end. Um, so I suppose what I settled on in the end is that you don't need very much. It's just like a little sprinkling of something extra to make it a bit more exciting. Like in this case, like, first drop compared to second drop is we've got tambourines, there's a ride in there coming in. And then the only other thing I really did is I've got like a sub kick drum here and I just brought in some saturation on that. Um, and I think I just used the, shall we see? There it is, yeah, it's just the Ableton saturator, I think, uh, bringing that in. 
somewhere. There's one that I'm using. Um, oh, yeah, it's this one that's automated here. And when you put saturation on very low sounds, like sub sounds, what they essentially do is add harmonics in the higher frequency. So it's sort of, if you, you could try this, if you take like an 808 and you add distortion, you slowly saturate it, uh, it's a bit like taking a really gnarly bass sound and opening the cutoff kind of does the same thing in that it slowly adds these high frequency sounds. So it's just like a little bit more of that just gives the bass a little bit more of a push and just makes it sound a bit like angrier <laughs> and more exciting. Um, yeah. And then there was one other thing that I thought was kind of cool that I did for the first time when I made this, which is when you get to the outro, I bring in this other kind of rolling jazzy thing here, like dr uh, drum track. This <laughs> And what was fun about this is I kind of I made this using one of those you know you get those like s sample instruments of like real stuff so you can get you know sample instrument pianos or or electric basses and I've I've got one that's like uh, a live drum kit recorded in the 60s way um, so I just kind of put some some patterns in there and then uh, yeah like wrote my own drum patterns processed it, EQ'd it, compressed it, bounced it out, and then treated it like a break. So then, and, and I think there's some there's something about like doing that, you know, at normal drum pitch, maybe doing it too slow, bouncing it out, and then speeding it up as you would if you were kind of processing a break. And that's quite fun, sort of like making my own breaks in the box uh, kind of thing that I ended up doing for the last section of this track. Um, so yeah, that was cool. And then outro, more bells and stuff, more vocals. Outro is kind of the intro in reverse, which is tried and tested. Uh, yeah, and that's so that's kind of yeah a little bit of a walk through the track. Um, what I might do now is kind of open it up and see if we've got any questions. Um, so yeah, if there's any in the room or if there's any any on the Twitch as well. Yeah. Uh, so that question was, how do I approach kind of adding in uh, like the little subtle details, sound of sound design elements and and synth elements as I'm kind of stretching out the track? Um, I mean, I guess for me, a lot of it is about trying. It is about this thing of trying to keep the interest up through a loop. Um, so usually, I do it as I go. Actually, I don't know whether. I'm sure lots of people don't produce like this, but uh, my kind of classic thing as I'm working through making a track is that however far I've got in the track, say I'm only halfway, it will pretty much be fully produced up until that point and then it will just stop. Because I kind of can't, I don't know, I find myself wanting to do those details. I, I'm trying to do that less because I think some, there's a value in trying to get the structure down, say, and then going back and doing that stuff. But I think it produces different results, actually. I think it makes a slightly different kind of track doing it that way. Um, so yeah, I don't know, as I go, I think a lot about the interaction with the drum groove, um, constantly thinking about where I need to kind of cut things out to make space, you know. Um, sometimes you can sharp cut and have a detail, but that's also tricky and sometimes just like completely ruins the flow, so sometimes it's like, can I get away with just taking the kick out and having this little detail here, or can I get, out, or does it? Do I need to kind of stop the hi hats for a second, or and yeah, loads of trial and error, basically, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the question is, what's my balance of software and hardware? Um, it's software, pretty much. Although, actually, I suppose one of the nice things about this remix is um, the stems I'm working with uh, from On Man. I think he uses quite a lot of hardware. So I do have some really nice, like I'll, I noticed this 
when I was looking at this the other day, this bass sound. Which is this really nice kind of warm, thick analog bass sound. Um, and that's really fun to play with. So I'd love to have like some hardware or maybe I'd be happy with loads of really nice samples of like, you know, like lovely analog synths. But for me, it was just when I got into write, writing um, this kind of music, it's like I'm renting, I move house, <laughs> it's expensive, it takes up space. So I've always been really in the box. And I feel fairly happy about that because I think I can have like a nice level of control over everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the question was, how important for me is is it in terms of uh, maintaining a structure of 16 bars, 32 bars? Um, it depends what kind of track I'm making. Um, I think like a lot of the stuff I did for my album, I tried to put those kind of concerns to one side and just kind of see how it flowed. And, and so my kind of main... Um, uh, driving point was just like, how's this sound? How's this feel to listen to? Does this feel right to listen to? But I think if you're making tracks that you want to be played in clubs, you can play with that for sure. And there are some great tracks that break away from the 1632 bar thing. Um, but it, it's a bit annoying for DJs. And I suppose, I think you have to have a good reason to do that because it becomes sort of a feature of the track and it becomes a bit of a pain to mix. Um, yeah, so I think otherwise, and it feels good, feels, you know, in 4-4, four, four, feels right, you know, you hear eight bars of something, feels right to have a little something else, 16 bars, feels like the moment to have a little something else. Um, I find often when you kind of stray away from that, the track just feels a bit off kilter sometimes, so, um, but yeah, it varies. So the question was, um, when I'm making music, uh, do I factor into like my kind of pre creative process where I want the music to land in terms of labels or clubs or uh, that sort of thing? Um, mm, I definitely think about like the context it's going to be played in. So like, is it a club track? Is it not? Um, Labels, I've not really done, I personally haven't really done that thing where I've kind of been like, what label do I want to be on? What kind of music do they make? I'm going to try and push this next EP in that direction, um, which I think is like good and fine and like great to explore different styles, but I've never kind of really done that myself. Um, but I, def I definitely think about like DJ ability and like, intensity um, and stuff like that um, and and so context I think is yeah important when I'm when I'm making something uh, yeah anything else yeah go So the question is basically, um, how do I interact with my software? Like, do I just use a keyboard or mouse, or do I have like MIDI controllers with sliders and you know drum pads and other interfaces? Um, mostly keyboard and mouse, and then I'll, and then a MIDI keyboard for for like playing in keys parts. That that was it for a really long time. Um, when I did my live set, I got some MIDI controllers with faders and knobs. And so sometimes I will, but it's very occasionally, it's like, okay, I want this synth part and I want this parameter to change across this synth part. So probably the easiest thing for me to do is just map this quickly and then, you know, do a take. Um, but I don't know, I just find it 
often easier and quicker and more precise to just like with the mouse, which is the maybe the less intuitive and more boring way of doing things, but um, works for me. Yeah. Yeah. What made me, uh, so the question was, what made me want to start performing live and how have I kind of navigated that changeover? And I'll talk actually, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the live set I did before I finish and how it kind of relates to some of the stuff we were talking about here. Um, I guess basically, uh, it came, for me it came after making a record, like when I made my last album, it wasn't a club record, it sat more in a sort of, ambient experimental slash club space. So um, just DJing off the back of that didn't make loads of sense. Um, and um, yeah, so then I sort of slowly came around to the idea of there being a live show that's more of an experience. Um, in terms of how I adapted to that change, that was quite tricky uh, for like, kind of technical reasons because I was like I made the album in a different door I used to use studio one and then I switched to Ableton and then I decided to do this and also the album it's like very through composed with lots of very specific detail um, and so I, I just had kind of no idea how I would go about uh, doing it live and I ended up having to like basically bounce out loads of stems and then like rewrite stuff in the live set and I ended up making a live set that was kind of the same every time I did it pretty much it's like kind of through composed with lots of kind of live elements but like it you know it was pretty much just one thing um, and I think it went quite well I think it was good but I didn't love doing it because it I, I kind of got a bit frustrated with the fact that it was just like one thing. And so I think if I did a live set again, I would probably um, try and build that into my process of making the music in the first place. Like the, the people whose live sets I really love, I, I mean, a lot of them use hardware actually, uh, but not all of them. But I think what they have in common is that that kind of live improvisational thing is kind of not only how they perform live, but it's also how they make tracks. Um, you know, either through like modular jams that they record in or like through using MIDI controllers and, and, and kind of recording stuff in, in the, ses in the uh, session and then moving it over. Um, so yeah, I think that probably tends to work a little bit better. I think I kind of, I managed it, but, <laughs> but it, it wasn't always easy and it wasn't always like super fun. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just before I do, any more questions? Who, uh, so the question is, So the question is, who's my inspirations in, in terms of like uh, people that have been able to, people that do those live sets and have been able to navigate that changeover? Um, uh, lots of people I played with, actually. So like the Delay Grounds live set, Surgeon's Girl is fantastic. Um, memory Play is great. Um, yeah, kind of. And, that, and it's a mixture, actually Yush, did a live set at a gig with me in Bristol recently, and I think it was her first time doing it, but it was fantastic, it really worked. Um, but yeah, I think it's that thing of like, the music is written for this, it's kind of a separate thing. Maybe it gets adapted for like a uh, release later on, but it's kind of like the, the live realization of it comes first, I guess is the difference with those kinds of artists. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, any more questions just before I kind of move on to that second bit? Uh, so the question is, are there any plugins or unusual techniques that I'm using to kind of create my drums or create my parts? Um, 
maybe not. <laughs> I think it's a it's a lot of put it's. I think my music is very based on like combining sounds, and so it's a lot of just pulling in stuff, pulling in drum samples, sort of producing them. You know, sometimes loops, sometimes breaks. Um, I will create like effect, like effects and ambiences and stuff from scratch. Um, and actually, that's kind of a good lesson to take from this whole thing of remixing. So here, one of the really fun things about doing this track was that I had loads of pre-made material that I could just like cut up and play with. It's kind of like sampling with permission, remixing, um, and that probably makes me like most happy <laughs> in terms of producing that's that's what I really love to do um but I yeah I guess more recently I've been thinking about how you can do that for yourself so like you know maybe every now and again you give yourself a day in front of Ableton where you're not trying to make a track you're just making sounds maybe making kind of weird rhythms you know connecting LFOs to other LFOs to you know you know, just trying to see what weird patches you can make and what weird sounds you can make, and then just bouncing down everything and putting it in a folder somewhere. Um, and I find that I don't have the patience to do that when I'm trying to make a track, but it's great to have stuff where it's like, oh yeah, this folder has loads of like weird risers, or this folder has loads of like interesting ambiences, and I can just grab this one that I made like a few weeks ago. Um, so like, I think there's something cool about like sampling yourself in that way. Um, and that's also basically what I ended up doing in my live set. Like, I kind of realized that I couldn't really recreate the stuff that I'd made in the studio very easily. So it's like, okay, I, the way I ended up approaching it was basically like a live remix. I was like, here are my stems. If I was kind of ignoring what these used to be, what can I make with them now? You know, whilst preserving like some kind of, um, character of, of the original track or something um yeah so i but i love that process of like reinterpreting stuff turning it on its head finding new life for things i feel like you could almost you know i mean this would be an interesting exercise for someone maybe but like you could almost make one track bounce out the stems see what second track you make bounce out the stems you know i wonder how long you could kind of keep going with just one set of material and reinterpreting it but um yeah yeah uh any more questions cool okay should we yeah so i mean i guess that was kind of the the thing i was thinking i could give an example of that remixing sort of type of vibe and i'll talk about maybe how i did that so um I'll play a little Updraft. bit um, of this is I'll just play a little bit of this is my track Crescent from my album. Um, Meeting place. Lots of these bits of live percussion. Percussion is my clamp and spinning. Um, Stopped dead. Lost. Goosebumps. Sign. You can you can hear it's quite sort of detailed and through composed, and that's a lot of me cutting up audio files and carefully positioning them and, and stuff like this. Um, and I just didn't know how to do that live. I was like, well, I could put all the samples in and map them to a, a push or something and trigger them, but what would be the point? Like, it would be the same, maybe not quite as good. So again, it was kind of like, how can I sort of do this same idea again from scratch? Um, so I'll, I'll play a little bit of the live set where I kind of approach this section, uh, which is at 1630. Um. Learning. Doorway. Maybe more? Cold stare. Downpour. Foothill. Too much. Knife edge. Word. It's a lie. Too much. Dial tone. Tense. Headwind. Doorway. 
sense of it um, and that was like Rumble. trying to find ways to, to take that track I made Too and make much. some kind of live version of it so I, I took all of those there's this Come list on. of words I put them into simpler I used that Backdrop. slice function and then used a couple of MIDI objects to make a randomness so that, that it would essentially like Remember randomly me. trigger all these words in random Learn. order um, then I'm playing two like two keys two and it's kind of a um, like a drum beat that goes Maybe. underneath. And then I've got a um, uh, a, a knob mapped to the master tempo and then s various sends to like reverbs, um, spectral delays and stuff like that. So that was it. It ends up being simpler, but it's still kind of nice and has its own quality. And it's just that was one of my favorite bits of the live set actually because it was one of the parts that felt most live because I was just super busy constantly doing stuff you know um yeah kind of tweaking things all the time um yeah but kind of didn't really have that much to do with the original track although it's maybe uh like yeah similar in spirit I guess um yeah yeah, so I suppose that's kind of one approach to like, if you want to do a live set and you're a producer um, and it's not integrated into your setup, I guess like one starting point is just to bounce out loads of stems and start playing with them. And I also found that like the bits that worked the best in the live set were often like the simplest. It was like, there were a few bits that were like so complicated in the way I set them up with chains of stuff relying on other stuff and and just like took hours and hours and I'm not sure they were as effective as like here's maybe two or three elements and like some really simple ways of affecting the way they're processed or uh, affecting like the rhythmic bed underneath. Um, yeah. But I suppose one slightly strange thing about my live set is so much of it is ambient. I feel like I never really cracked how to do like a club live set. So that's definitely maybe on the agenda for me in the future. But uh, yeah. Um, Cool. Well, I think unless there's any other questions, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Right. Yeah. Thank you.